Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Judah Levine. I'm a faculty member here. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Marla Dow. Uh, Marla is, uh, well, she actually was at Jilla at one time. Uh, then she was in nuclear physics. Uh, before Jilla. Uh, before Jilla. Before and and uh, then she was in atomic physics. And now she's the director of the NIST Boulder Laboratory, which you see on the left hand, the left hand picture is the, is the Boulder Laboratory, which is just south of Baseline Road on Broadway, if, you, if you've ever been there. Uh, we used to give guided tours, but I don't think we give guided tours. No, tour we, do, we do. We do. We, do we, give, we, we, we still give guided tours. tours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you get give guided tours. You can see all the wonderful stuff. And she's, going, she's the director of the Boulder Laboratory, and she's going to talk about all, she's going, all sorts of interesting stuff. She's the director of the CHIPS program, which is a, a half a billion dollar program to deal with uh, semiconductor manufacturing and, and the next generation of stuff. Oh. <laughs> okay, thanks. Oh, thanks, uh, If you have questions, uh, please wait till I bring the microphone so everybody can hear it. But, but otherwise, welcome. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes? No. Yes? No. Th that's better. Better. This is my fourth talk this week. I lost my voice somewhere between Alabama and Pennsylvania, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so Judah mentioned I'm Marla Dowell. Um, my, for, I was thinking we'd have more students here, so I, I'm kind of pitching my talk at you. And um, I have stickers, so if you ask a question, no matter your age, you get a sticker, okay? <laughs> um, uh, I, I have um, degrees in physics, and I joke that I like all physics. As Judah mentioned, I started my career in nuclear physics did a postdoc here in atomic physics, and ended up doing laser physics at NIST. Um, and I could spend just a whole day talking about how you switch fields in physics, but um, if, if you want to hear about that. So feel free to ask me questions about that later. Today, what I'm going to tell you is basically four stories of how laser measurements affect your daily lives, and how come it can be kind of difficult and hopefully for the students of any age here, you'll take away the fact that uh, think carefully about how you do measurements in the future, okay? So how many people have heard of NIST? Ah, all right, good. So NIST has actually been around since 1901. People don't, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it started out as the National Bureau of Standards. It's the only federal laboratory that's, whose sole mission is to support industry. And we do this through world-leading scientific and engineering research. Um, national manufacturing programs like Manufacturing USA that you may have heard of. And we do a lot of tech transfer. We have a lot of uh, companies that get sp spun out of NIST. Um, as I mentioned, we're the nation's industry lab. It's kind of exciting. We are the only science agencies that's mentioned in the Constitution. Um, so there you go. That's our claim to fame. George Washington talked about the importance of measurements in the first day of the Union Address. Um, my personal favorite is the quote from Lord Kelvin, if you can't measure, you can't improve it or innovate. Um, and up to 92% of US exports depend on measurements and standards. So you can see that it's sort of really important um, uh, everywhere. But Let's try and make this a little bit more personal. How many people have renovated their house or done something like that? A couple of you, right? So you can imagine why is metrology or measurements important? If you've ever done a home improvement project and maybe you were renovating your bathroom. So you had a plumber and you had a framer and they had a blueprint. Imagine, if you will, if they didn't have the same ruler or if their ruler wasn't calibrated. You could wind up with your sink in your living room, which would be a bad thing, okay? I think we can all agree that that would be a bad thing. But what's important? So we can agree that maybe they should be using the same ruler. So that gets to the sort of accurate tools. Um, this is actually a great real life example. I don't know if people have ever heard of Cook's Illustrated. It used to be like my favorite. It's like cooking for science nerds, okay? They did this whole comparison on different measuring um, cups. And it turns out when they looked at all these different measuring cups, they actually weren't all one cup, wasn't necessarily one cup. So here you see is the actual value for those four different types of cups. So having an accurate tool is really important. But it turns out having good measuring practices also, how people use those cups 
is really important too. And so here's an example where person A uses those different cups and maybe they are a uh, scooper, okay? And they don't scoop to the top, I'm a scooper. And person B might use them a different way. So you can have variability just from different people using these different cups. And that's okay if you're making cookies, but it's probably not so great if you're trying to make a souffle, okay? So accurate tools, good measuring practices, but also what you're trying to do. All right, so let's, let's dive into lasers. And I actually brought a laser with me today. Let's see if it's, there we go, okay. So what's important for good laser measurements? Let's think about this laser. So here is actually um, a neodymium YAG laser. And this is, uh, think of the laser light or like the light coming out of my laser pointer, this green light. This is the flower, okay. And this little round black thing right here that's my laser detector. In this case, it was measuring laser power. So that's like my cup. The thing about lasers is there are lots of different parameters that you care about depending on the application. You might care about power. That's the energy per second. You might care about energy. You might care about, this is continuous, okay? So it's on all the time. Or it could be pulsed, like the types of lasers that are used in optical communication systems. What's the angular distribution, the spatial uniformity, and the color, like this color is green, you could also have red, you can have blue, you can have infrared, you can have ultraviolet, lots of different colors. And then you can also have all these different detector parameters too, like the temporal response, or how it responds with time, um, angular response, linearity is if you put in a watt, and you measure a watt, and then you put in two watts, you double it, does the signal double, or does it actually go up exponentially? So that's whether or not it's linear. So lots of different things that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to make these laser measurements. So why should you care about laser measurements? It turns out, how many people have like a, uh, an, have a phone that has facial recognition in it? Okay, guess what? All your phones have lasers in them. Okay, how many people have a car that makes an annoying beep when you get too close to something? Okay, your cars have lasers in them. <laughs> how many people have a DVD player? Okay, there you go, so you got lasers. So you got lots of lasers. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many lasers each person owns. But there are lots of things like medical applications, LASIK, I don't know if anybody here has ever had LASIK before, that's the laser eye surgery correction. Uh, photodynamic therapy, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. That's uh, lasers for cancer treatment. People use lasers for removing tattoos. <laughs> and I could like spend an hour telling you why you might wanna be careful about doing that. <laughs> and then there are a lot of lasers used in dental procedures. If you've ever done a dental procedure and they made you wear these really dark glasses that are probably doing a laser procedure on you. I mentioned communications, there's also sensing. There was a spun, out, a spun out company out of the University of Colorado called Long Path Technologies. It was joint with NIST. They um, have invented this laser method for looking at methane emissions from fracking sites, and they could detect the equivalent methane emission of a half a human breath up to, I think it's 10 kilometers away, which is mind blowing, right? <laughs> and it really great that you can do that. There's LiDAR, that's the beeping thing in your car, and the facial recognition on your phone. Um, but lasers are also used for a lot of materials processing. People don't realize it, but lasers are used today, are often used to cut fabric to make clothes, and also for welding in cars. There are lots of different types of lasers that I sort of mentioned. There are lots of different kinds of detectors and measurements that we're trying to make there are a lot of common laser measurement mistakes, and those are the things that I'm gonna kinda get into. And they kinda all fall into three categories. Um, it's either the right equipment, but the wrong method, the wrong equipment, <laughs> or a poor experimental design. So we'll talk, talk a little bit about some of these examples today, and, um, and I'm gonna ask you questions also to see if you can think about good ways to maybe improve these. So let's talk a little bit about 
photodynamic therapy. Um, this, was, this is actually really interesting. How many people have ever heard of photodynamic therapy? Okay, a couple people here. Um, what photodynamic therapy is, is it's really great treatment for very aggressive forms of cancer that are hard to operate on, okay? And the way that it works is uh, a person ingests a photosynthesizer uh, drug, a drug called a photosynthesizer. And that drug gets preferentially absorbed in the tumor, but not the surrounding tissue. And then they wait a certain amount of time so that you absorb that in the tumor. And then what you do is you expose it to that laser light, okay? And the critical pa parameter here is laser dose, or the power per unit area. And what ends up happening is when that laser dose um, hits that chemical, it creates a chemical reaction if the dose is high enough, but not too high, um, which basically releases oxygen, starves oxygen from the tumor, and it preferentially kills the tumor cells, but not the good cells surrounding it. So you can think of things like for pancreatic cancer and other forms of cancer that may be difficult to operate on, you could kill the bad cells without doing anything to the good surrounding cells. And this is really great. And about 10 years ago, I got contacted by some medical doctors who were doing some clinical studies on trying to use photodynamic therapy for treating a particular form of cancer. And what they were seeing is in the clinical settings, they were seeing 30% variability in those dose measurements. So why is that important? What happens, do you think, if you don't have enough laser dose to, to excite those photosynthesizers? You, you, you wasted your time, right? It didn't kill the cells. And the problem with the way the cancer works is they're gonna do those tests later on. It might take you a couple weeks to figure out that you didn't actually kill those cells. So, so that's really bad, okay, that's bad. Because the other thing with these photosynthesizers is they can be toxic, and so that means you can't also can't get that treatment again for maybe another six months. So that's a bad outcome. What happens if you put in too much laser dose? Okay. Yeah, so you could, you could hurt the surrounding tissue, okay? You could actually really do damage to that photosynthesizer drug so that it's not effective also. So there's actually a narrow window in laser dose of, um, of, of what, that, um, what the appropriate dose is. Now let's see, we've got a, there you go. You may be covering this later. I just wanted to ask, so you mentioned pancreatic cancer, which is very deep in the body. And so, for example, with radiation therapy, there's a lot of uh, potential damage to the tissues from the surface to the target. What about for lasers? Yeah, so that's so the thing that's really cool about lasers, um, uh, as opposed to the radiation, is you can use an optical fiber to get the laser radiation right to the tumor so that you don't have to worry about the light going through all of the surrounding tissue. Uh, optical fiber, it's the same thing that they use for optical communications to transmit photons from one place, one place to another. So that's a great question. So, so there, it turns out that there is a narrow window of, of dose. Um, so working with these doctors, they came to me and they just said, just tell us which detector to buy, okay? What's the problem with telling them which detector to buy? The problem is if you tell them which detector to buy, maybe that detector is not available in three years. It would be like saying, which tires should I buy for my car? Will those tires still be available five years from now, 10 years from now, or 15 years from now? Then there's also, it turns out with these clinics, the reason why they were having this wide variability was some were actually using the right detector, some were using the wrong detector, some were using the right detector but the wrong way, they were measuring power instead of power per area, which is the important parameter, okay? And then um, so, some were just not doing good repeatable measurements. So instead, what we did was, um, let's see, working with those doctors, actually, we wrote a whole paper about this. And <laughs> it's funny because I think 
Judah was mentioning, mostly the, you have academics who come in here and talk about this, and one of the metrics for success in academics is how many citations you get for your paper. I am pretty sure I have zero citations for this paper, but it's the paper that I'm most proud of, because with this paper, we actually taught those clinics how to make calibrated measurements, how to make those measurements repeatable, what were the important parameters, and how to choose the right detector. And the variability in this study went from 30% to less than 5%. So for me, you know, I feel like I made a really big difference here in, um, in, in basically helping people understand how to do those laser measurements better. Okay, any questions about photodynamic therapy? Okay, so if you ever have to have it done, you should make sure to say, have you calibrated your detector? <laughs> when was the last time you did that? So, so that's kind of one problem. Another interesting problem that we did once, so one of the benefits about working at NIST is it's industry's lab. We get a lot of, I don't know if I call them crazy phone calls, Judah, but we get a lot of phone calls from different companies with different problems. And it was interesting because one day I got a phone call from a company that was trying to make rocket engines. Okay, and they were using lasers to do the welding because it turns out lasers are really good if you're trying to weld very different materials together. And in this case, you can kind of think of like what are some of the important material parameters for rocket engines? You want something that has a very high melting point, but also you want to be able to dissipate the, the, the heat. Okay, so they were trying to, they were trying to weld together one kind of metal that had a very um, high melting point to another kind of metal, which would take the heat away fast, faster. Um, and the problem that they were trying to do is, this is actually the NIST laser welding booth, and you can see, you can kind of see it here, it's writing NIST on a piece of steel, is that the power that you're trying to measure when you're welding is at kilowatt levels. So if the power is enough to melt metal, what are you gonna use to measure that power? Okay. Oops, oops, I went, went too far. So let's, let's talk about this. Like trying to make these laser measurements in a welding environment is really challenging for a number of reasons. So I mentioned the, the, the power in the laser is really high. Uh, it might be 10 to the eight to 10 to the 12 watts per meter squared. Okay, this is, higher, more power than on the surface of the sun, okay? Um, the threshold for melting steel is 10 to the six watts per meter squared. When you're welding, there's actually four states of mat matter present. You have gas, you have liquid, you have solid, and you have a plasma. And it's a very dirty environment also. Um, there are also multiple time scales. There's the time scale that the laser is on, there's the time scale that heat is dissipated in the, in the metal that you're trying to weld. Um, and then you also care about multiple physical scales from nanometers, like in the weld zone, all the way up to what's the quality of the weld over, over a larger weld here, okay? And, and you can see here is actually, I think it's a TEM image, <coughs> excuse me, of, of a weld, and you can see on this micron type scale, you can see micro cracks. You can see the different kind of materials in the weld pool. Um, and this is just sort of the base copper over here. And you might say, well, you know, the rocket, this is a really specialty application. You know, how, how big of a problem this is, is this? Well, after we started working on this problem, we actually started working with a major automotive manufacturer um, who was using lasers to weld car doors, all right? And that doesn't sound like as big a deal. But when they are doing these car doors, they only actually, at the time, they were only looking at one in a thousand car doors. They would take them apart and inspect them. And they do a destructive test to see how well the weld was. Was it a good weld or a bad weld? Okay, well, what happens if it's a bad weld? What do you think they do with those other 999 doors? They throw them away, mind blowing. <laughs> okay, so they're throwing, they're throwing away. It turns out bad welds on car doors at the time 
this is about eight years ago, were costing the industry $40 million a year. Okay? So if we could come up with a way that would actually predict whether or not those welds would be good, right, or better inspection methods that say instead of looking at one in a thousand car doors, can we look at one in a hundred car doors? We could save a lot of money, right? So that was pretty exciting. Um, and I got a paper in the American Journal of Welding out of that too, which was kind of fun. <laughs> so. So we, we, we came at this from two different perspectives. One is it turns out that people were not measuring their laser power right. They weren't using the right detectors. Um, the de kind of detectors that they were using were getting damaged as they were trying to make those laser measurements um, because if they were sort of melting the detectors or they would heat up the detectors. So the first thing we did was come up with a better way of measuring laser power really accurately. So at the time, they were sort of wide variability from both just repeatable measurements, damaging the detector, using the wrong detector, and they were also seeing sort of 20 to 30% differences. And at the time, the, there were two main ways of me measuring laser power, either thermal. So what that does is the way that it works is it takes the laser, it's absorbed on the surface, the laser power is turned into heat, and you measure the temperature rise due to the laser power. It's not gonna work, right, if you have a kilowatt laser. <laughs> the other way is quantum detectors where it converts a photon energy to an electron energy. It's also not gonna work. You're just gonna melt those detectors. And um, some very clever people at NIST, actually it was John Lehman, came up with this idea that at these power levels, the force from photons on a surface um, was measurable, and it turns out that the equivalent force of a four kilowatt laser is about 26 micronewtons. So by putting a mirror on a force meter, we could bounce a laser off a mirror and measure how much power was in the mirror, uh, was, was in the laser. Yes? I just wanna ask a basic question about the photon. Yeah. Photons have momentum. Fo fo photon photons have momentum. So the way to think about it is, think about if I have a tennis ball and I bounce it against the surface, right? It's going to exert a force on that surface. Okay. So it's the same thing with the photon on a mirror. Think of the photon as like a tennis ball. It has. It has. Um, yes. So momentum and energy. So the change in momentum is, generates a force, okay? And you can measure, it turns out you can measure force very accurately. Yes? Just a real quick question. So you're using a force detector for this kilowatt laser. How is your stuff not melting though? Because isn't it supposed to be melting? Yeah, so the, here's the thing is when you, so you can get a mirror, we can get mirrors that are 99.99% reflective, okay? So if it's reflecting the light, I'm, I'm bouncing the light off the surface of these mirrors, it's not being absorbed. And the thing that's really kind of clever about this approach is that when that laser bounces off that mirror, now you can use it for welding. You could use it for cutting. You can use it for anything else. So you can actually measure these kilowatt laser, the power in a kilowatt laser very accurately in real time as you're doing this processing. Um, and it was a game changer um, for a number of people who are trying to use lasers for, in welding for different applications. The other thing that we have available at NIST is, so there's on the power side, so that's the processing piece, is offline. Um, we had some groups who were looking at the materials properties and the weld properties using something called correlative imaging. And this, um, some of these imaging techniques also use lasers. But the, the main thing is that they could do correlative imaging looking at um, these materials at the centimeter scale all the way down to the nanometer scale and look for trends in what was causing welds to fail. Um, and the thing that's really kind of interesting about this correlative imaging is it does require a way of calibrating and standard reference materials in order to use all these different instruments because no one instrument can span all these different uh, length scales. 
But uh, using these kind of techniques, they were able to actually see that for bridge steels, sometimes the placement of a single copper atom could mean the difference between whether that bridge steel failed or, um, was, um, or, or was still strong enough for its application. And the other thing that was really kind of interesting about this correlative imaging technique is they could actually then start doing different processes on those bridge steels and say, at what point, um, what are, what's, the, you know, what's the mechanism that's causing that bridge steel to fail? And some of the similar things with the welding that we were doing. One of the other things that's kind of interesting about laser welding is it's much more efficient than traditional welding. And so that's one reason why people are interested in being able to use it more widely and why measurements like these are really important in order to have broader adoption of laser welding. Yeah? Can you give an approximation of how many welds there are in a typical car? Oh, there are a lot of welds, but I actually don't know. Uh, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even be able to hazard to say, but if you just think about just the door itself, um, what's interesting about a car door is that um, if you think about it, it's like, a, it's like a big rectangle with a hole in the middle, right? They don't cut the hole, it's usually one welded piece here, two on the side, and one on the bottom, because that's less waste than having a blank and cutting a hole in it. So, Yeah. 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 But actually, if you think about it, um, how, your phone has welds in it. Okay. Your computer has welds in it. A lot of the furniture, if you have metal furniture, actually, these chairs in this auditorium have welds in them too. So welding is welding has been around for a hundred years, but we still have a lot to learn, which is kind of the fun thing about physics. Any other questions about welding? No. Okay. Um, so now let's let's go. Here's another example. This is actually an example of 10 gigabit Ethernet transceivers. So think of these are the things that in this building here, we probably have 10 gigabit Ethernet in the building. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in the building there are these transceivers throughout the building, and what they do is they help move the signals from one location to another, okay? And these 10 gigabit ethernet transceivers were introduced about 10 years ago, and when they first came out, um, a lot of them failed the, failed the tests, okay? And it was a big deal, because in this case, this is the same transceiver, and this is two different oscilloscopes that they did the test in, and one oscilloscope passed the transceiver, and the other oscilloscope failed the transceiver. Okay, and in this case, what, what ends up happening is if, an if the transceiver fails the test, they throw it away. Because you don't actually, if you think about it, if you've ever been through a project where they put ethernet into your building, it's very disruptive, they have to put holes in the walls, so you never wanna put a bad transceiver in the field because it's really challenging to replace. So when these first came out, the estimate of, of failing, uh, how much money they were losing just from failing perfectly good transceivers was about $200 million a year. It's a big number, <laughs> okay? So knowing which one of these passed or not um, was an important question that a number of companies came to us and they, they wanted some help figuring it out. So let's talk a little bit about what that test is. How many people have used an oscilloscope? Okay, quite a few. I'm going to blow your mind. You know how the oscilloscope says 50 ohm impedance on it? Okay. That changes with frequency. So <laughs> most people just use oscilloscopes for like a conventional measurement, and it's not very high speed. So the fact that it's not perfectly 50 ohms at all frequencies is irrelevant. But what ends up happening is when you try to measure a 10 gigabit ethernet transceiver, the fact that that frequency is changing, that impedance is changing with frequency, can mean the difference between a good measurement and a bad measurement. 
So how do these measurements done? So a, a 10 gigabit ethernet transceiver is sending pulses of light around, and what they care about is the bits, zero and one, zero and one. So the test is actually looking at these transitions from zero to one, and it takes all the different permutations going from zero to one, one to zero, then zero, think of this as zero, and then one, one, and then zero, and so it overlays, and it ends up with this little box here. And if the eye, this is called an eye diagram, if the eye is very open, then that means that it's, you've got good fidelity and whether or not you have a zero or a one. Okay, so then the, the, then the transceiver passed the test. But if you don't, if that eye is closed or if there's some parts of the signal that ends up in these forbidden regions, then it fails the test. So why does it fail? Well, about 10 years ago, if you bought an oscilloscope, um, and today if you buy most sort of conventional off-the-shelf oscilloscopes, the kind that you would use in, say, a high school or an undergraduate lab, they calibrate them and they give you two parameters. One is the rise time. So how fast does a signal go up from the 10% level to the 90% level, okay? And then it will also do peak height or peak voltage, okay? So what's the, what's the voltage per, um, per section in that oscilloscope? But here's the problem. Here are two different responses from, from these gigabit ethernet transceivers they have the same rise time, but do the pulses look the same? No, okay? So, so, so that's a problem, right? So rise time is really not a good parameter for trying to do these measurements on these 10 gigabit re uh, transceivers. We really need to know what does the full waveform look like, right? All the points. So let's think about how these, oh, and the reason why you should care about this, <laughs> this is the thing we started looking about this, this was really kind of interesting. Turns out we did a back of the envelope calculation because that's what physicists love to do. <laughs> and we thought, how many freshmen across the United States take freshman physics? And you can look that number up in the APS statistics. Turns out at least 200,000 students learn how to use an oscilloscope in college every year which is a lot of students, okay? Um, at NIST, we actually looked in our property database. Turns out there's an oscilloscope at NIST for every three staff members, and that includes everybody. That includes not just the scientists, but also the people who do payroll and HR and everything like that. So that's a lot of oscilloscopes, and they probably have a lot of oscilloscopes here at CU also. And it turns out that this global market in oscilloscopes is about $2 billion a year. So it's a really big market trying to understand how these oscilloscopes work and so that people can use them correctly is, is, is important. So the way that an oscilloscope works, um, and here is kind of three different examples of oscilloscopes, is you have the signal that you're trying to measure, that's the source. You can think of your oscilloscope as like a channel and a receiver. There's a part of the, part of the oscilloscope that's receiving that signal, that's called the channel, and then the receiver is the detector that's detecting the signal. Okay? And then what you end up getting out is this measured output. And the reason why that source, in an ideal situation, the source would equal the measured output, right? But as I mentioned, there are things like the fact that your oscilloscope isn't perfectly 50 ohms at all frequency responses, and lots of other reasons, you know, sort of the, the time responses of the channel and the receiver that end up causing distortion in the signal that you're trying to measure. Okay, so the question, and, and the way to think about this, this is really challenging, is because this is a dynamic measurement. This is not a measurement where it's like a CW laser that you can just sort of measure it and wait a long time and get a more accurate measurement. You know, you're gonna send a pulse and then in nanoseconds the pulse will be gone. So we thought a while about it and we, just, and we figured out that, um, we figured out a way to actually calibrate out this channel and receiver response. And the way that we did that is we took a source that essentially acted like a delta function. Does everybody know what a delta function is? Well, some of you do, okay. A delta function is something that is basically, think of it as like an, it's like a, an infinitely thin point. Like think of it as like looking like this 
uh, you know, an, uh, yeah, an, like pretend that that's a pencil instead of this envelope there for the source, okay? So it turns out if this, if we send in a pulse, which is just much faster than the response of the channel and the receiver and the oscilloscope, we can actually, on a point-by-point -point basis, map out the whole oscilloscope response, okay? So basically think of it as getting a calibration function of the oscilloscope, and instead of just the rise time, we're getting what we call the full waveform measurement there. And, and, and that's essentially what, it, what we did. Um, or it's uh, this NIST electro-optic system method. It also characterized the impedance at all these different frequencies. It turns out this is really good not just for calibrating oscilloscopes, but a whole bunch of other, think of all this other high-speed test equipment that's available out there, mostly used in the communications industry, but there are also lots of other applications as well. And by having that full waveform response on that point-by-point -point basis, we could take these signals, these eye diagrams that we were measuring before, and apply a correction function so that companies could, even if they didn't had two different oscilloscopes with two different answers, as long as it was calibrated, they could actually get the same answer. So, yes, I, I, people have been asking I'm questions. I haven't. The, the actual wave, the 10 gigasecond in each k equals zero to one, or vice versa, can happen. It happens in one times 10 to the minus 10 seconds. That's right. And the, all the sampling you're doing, let's say you divide that into 10 points, then you're one times 10 to the minus. So, so it turns, yeah. So, it, so it turns out if you do some Fourier analysis, it turns out what you want is basically to be able to sample at ten times faster than whatever the pulse is you're trying to measure. Okay, so if you're trying to do a ten gigabit Ethernet transceiver, then you have to actually be able to do it at a hundred gigahertz. Okay, um, but today people are trying to make hundred gigahertz transceivers, which means you need a terahertz to keep ahead of them, okay? So what's interesting is that the problem that we had 10 years ago with these 10 gigabit ethernet transceivers we're having again today. Um, and the upshot is, is that currently there's no traceable equipment for 6G technology. And that's kind of why you should care. Because until we have that calibration equipment, then it's gonna be hard to know which ones actually pass the tests and, and which, ones, which ones fail. Any other questions? Okay, so here's my last example. Hopefully you're finding these, exa these examples interesting. A design of experiments. Has, how many people have heard of design of experiments? Oh, good, okay. So this is really important. I don't know if we have any, any college students here. High school, all right, one college student, okay. Ta if you ever have a chance to take a class in design of experiments, or even like some, listen to some lectures online or something like that, this is really important. Because today, when we're trying to do measurements, a lot of the systems that we're trying to characterize are really complex. They have a lot of variables. There are a lot of dependent factors. Maybe it's temperature. Um, maybe it's the calibration factors. Um, think about trying to do tests on a complex system like a car with all the different sensors that are on it today or um, maybe it's a, a system that's being controlled by artificial intelligence. There's a lot of different factors going on kind of under the hood. And what a design of experiments allows you to do is there are different ways of doing comparative testing. Um, you can use it for screening characterization. Sometimes people are, can design their experiments to, to basically develop a model for predictive behavior or to optimize a system, okay? And the example that I'd like to kind of leave you with is um, this study that NIST did on wireless emissions impact on navigation systems, okay? How many people have heard about like the concerns over 5G and airplanes? Everybody's right there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, this wasn't actually, in, this was actually before 5G, this was using LTE phones. Okay, but um, the Department of Defense was concerned about the impact of aggregate emissions of LTE systems on their Navy radars. 
Okay, so what is aggregate emissions? Imagine, if you will, how many people have a phone in their pocket today? Everybody's got a phone, right? Okay, guess what? Our phones are all emitting right now, okay? If we could look at that, if we could actually see what those wireless emissions were, look, we'd see different patterns, right? And how my phone interacts with your phone is different than my phone interacting with your phone. And guess what? If I walk over here, what happens? The, yeah, the interaction is different and it changes, okay? All right. And what happens if the temperature changes? Right, okay. What happens if I have like an iPhone and you have a Google Pixel? It's different, it's different, right? Um, what happens if there's a base station here? Okay, there are lots of different things. So think of like trying to figure out how do we do all these system measurements on all these different systems when all of these variables are changing? And think about what they're concerned about is like, what happens if I have five phones near my Navy radar or 50 phones? Well, if it's a base station instead of a phone. So how do you design an experiment that looks at all these different factors of all these different things that are emitting? And by the way, your car is emitting also. It can be emitting at those wavelengths too. Or it could be uh, weather radar systems and, 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 and other things as well. How do, you, how do you design a set of experiments that can actually identify what are the sources of the largest impact on these, uh, on these radar systems? And then why do we care about this? Well, this is actually the map of um, how all these different communication frequencies are allocated in the United States. And basically, LTE starts around here and 5G is here, 5G and 6G is here. <coughs> and if we look at these and blow them up, you can see that in any one of these little frequency bands are lots of different things that are all operating at the same time. And you don't want them to, well, what they call it is you don't want them to interfere with them, but guess what? There's actually, there's no definition of what e interference is. So a NIST, because we were trying to be quantitative, we talk about impact and we talk about things like what is the, um, the dB impact so that somebody else can decide whether 5 dB or 30 dB is, um, is gonna cause interference with their systems. So we took these complicated systems, we actually ran a huge call for public input from communications engineers across the United States and said, what do you think are gonna be the biggest sources of impact with these LTE systems on these Navy radars? And it turns out, for example, a wireless base station that allows LTE phones to communicate with one another has over 2,000 different parameters on just that, <laughs> just that base station. Your phone has something like over hundreds of parameters on your phone on how it can be operated. So kind of going through, collecting all these different things, getting people to weigh in and to comment on it, we then took thousands of these different settings of these commercial equipment and we narrowed it down to 28 factors. And these are those 28 factors. The ones in green are the ones that kind of got the most fo votes from these professional communications engineers. They said these are the things that are gonna cause, and most likely cause the most, the biggest impact on those Navy radar systems. If we had actually gone through and done a measurement on every one of those settings, it would have taken 20 years to do over two million measurements. It would have taken over 20 years to do over two million measurements. Couldn't do that in 20 years, right? By the time that, think of what generation of foam we're gonna be using by then, right? <laughs> So instead, what we did was a design of experiments. We did a factor screening, and we figured out all these different dependent variables, and we came up with a range of 1,056 unique measurement configurations that could test all of these 28 parameters. It was the largest factor screening that NIST had ever done. And the thing that actually made this a little bit more challenging was the fact that the response variable that we were trying to measure 
wasn't a scale or it wasn't a fixed number, these wireless phones that you're emitting are actually emitting in a distribution that has a time dependence. The other thing that was really hard is that it's commercial equipment. Do you think your phone is set up to make measurements on it 24 seven? No, it's not like a, a standard piece of test equipment that you would have in your lab. Um, and, and because we still had over a thousand measurements that we had to do, we had to automate all this commercial equipment, which was really challenging also. Um, and what we needed to do, because we knew that things would be changing with time, is to build in a regular calibrations of all of this equipment as we're making all these measurements. Um, so what was interesting that came out of this, so we did all of that work. Um, it's the first time anybody had ever actually done a statistical analysis on commercial communication systems. And the two most important factors that they could change were not any of these top seven, but actually how the power was controlled on the base station. And um, down here, this is some of the channel, the uplink channel resources on the phone. So it turns out, in this case, just by changing how the base stations were operated, going from an open loop power control to a closed loop, closed loop power control, reduce the impact on those Navy radar systems by 80%, which was acceptable to, to the Navy folks. And it's a big deal because it turns out, I mean like these random things that you learn, turns out that 80% of the people in the United States live within, I think it's 20 miles of the ocean or 50 miles of the ocean. And so you wanna be able to use your phone near the ocean where people have Navy radars and now by just changing the base station settings, people can do that. Um, and we're working on studies sort of related to that with the 5G and the airplanes as well. We can come up with measurements and identify what are the dependent parameters that cause, cause the most impact on those plane systems. So that's it. Those are my, my stories for today. Hopefully you found it entertaining. Go forth and make measurements. <laughs> But ask yourself as you're doing this, are you using the right equipment? Are you using the, the equipment the right way? And do you know how to spell equipment? <laughs> and how good is your experimental design? And I wanna, I wanna make sure that this is a lot of work from a lot of different people. There are a lot of great folks at NIST. And if you wanna learn more about any of this work, these are folks um, who have been working in that space. So I wanna give a big shout out to all of those folks and since we have an undergraduate student, I hope you apply for a summer undergraduate research fellowship here at NIST. So thanks. Uh, 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 thank you, Marla. Uh, uh, questions? Yeah. <coughs> so you mentioned that uh, it was important to have pure 50 ohm uh, power, I guess, for the oscilloscope? Not, no, not necessarily. It's just to understand how it's changing, right? And to recognize that it's not 50 ohms all the time. So but if you want to trust the output. Well, so it, it depends. It depends on frequency. If you're trying to, if you're using your oscilloscope in a standard high school lab, it's a non-issue because you're not. For your, for your purposes. But for our purposes, we needed to understand what the, what the impedance is as a function of frequency. Yeah. The, the signal, if, if it's not exactly 50 ohms, part of the signal will bounce back. And, and, and so what you see is not really what's there because part of it has bounced back. And, and that's- It distorts, it just, yeah, it distorts, yeah. You, you want, you want the, the thing expects 50 ohms, and if it's not 50 ohms, then part of the signal bounces back, and it bounces back and goes back in the table, and hits something else, and it bounces back, <laughs> and you see these rings. Rouse around. Which are, which are the signal bouncing back and forth in the table. Yeah. It's a very undesirable situation. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you, what you're seeing is not really what's there. You, you're creating problems. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, other questions? Sure. Um, how many inputs do you get a year, and how many are you able to <laughs> oh, with? Oh, handle? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, how many inquiries... A year do we get at NIST? How many can we resolve? And um, um, how many can you work on? 
how many can we work on? You know, that, that's, that's hard. It's, we get a lot more inquiries than we can work on. Um, um, it's hard for me to know how many per year we, we get. The thing that we've done, a lot of resources, if you go to NIST, there are, we, all of our documents, all of our publications are in the public domain. It's required as part of the Open Data Act um, that was passed under, I think, President Obama. So there are documents at NIST that actually are best me measurement practices. There's actually a document on the NIST webpage about um, how to design experiments. There's the guide for uncertainty and measurement. So there's a lot of resources out there, and um, things like calibrations at NIST.gov is a great place to start if you have a question about how to measure a particular quantity, okay? Um, my personally, like how I decided like to work on these things, it was often um, I got multiple questions from sort of similar things, like with the welding example, and the photodynamic therapy one, that was a no-brainer, you know, when these doctors came to talk to me about that one. I, I knew that that could be a real, real difference maker. Other questions? Uh, just to answer your question, uh, I work on the time service. I get about uh, 10 requests a day for help. Yeah. Uh, most of them come by email, and most of them are simple questions uh, because people don't understand the service, they don't know how to use the service. Yeah. Uh, the more complicated questions are much more difficult to answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, so, so if you go if you go on this website, they do economic impact reports. So one of the ones uh, about 10, 15 years ago, they did an economic impact report on the laser calibration services, which was, which is where I started my career at NIST. And I think the if I remember correctly, the number that they quoted from that economic impact report was that for every dollar of research that we spent at NIST on that, it generated fifty dollars of impact. Uh, to the U.S. economy. Um, the part that that doesn't measure, in my, in my mind, though, is uh, over at NIST Boulder, about half of our staff, our students, their postdocs, or, or other visiting scientists. Um, and that workforce development piece, in, in my mind, is probably one of the most important things that we do because folks who come and work at NIST learn how to do these good measurement practices. They go off and they work at Google and Ball and Lockheed Martin and all these other places, and we're disseminating all these great practices kind of throughout the industry. Yeah, yeah. Any other uh, questions? Other questions? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we, have, we hire a lot of physicists, um, but we also hire engineers. Um, the funny thing about working at a place like NIST is, for example, you know, I started my career in nuclear physics, and now I'm doing laser physics. Um, the, because we work on a lot of these interdisciplinary programs, some uh, problems, I would say sometimes it's, do you have good alignment with the skill sets that we need? You know, the example that I would give you is um, that kilowatt laser power detector that was based on photon momentum. Um, this really brilliant postdoc, Ali Artusio Glimpse, figured out how to make it on a chip so that you could put it behind just a mirror so that somebody could actually put it in a weld head, which is really, really great. Her degree was actually in mechanical engineering. Her bachelor's degree was a BFA in photography. Okay, you know, when she was getting her BFA in photography, she became really interested in how cameras work, which led her to getting a PhD in mechanical engineering. So it's really, I think it's really important to, to maybe, some, some, getting, having a, a degree that's sort of recognized and well aligned with like a job thing is, is sometimes easier to get your foot in the door, but sometimes it's really focusing on where the skill sets that they have um, that align with the problem that you're trying to do. And I guess what I would say to the students who are here um, today is 
don't let yourself get limited by the degree that you have. If you discover a passion later on in life for something that's not quite aligned with what your degree is in, um, you can become, like I, I joke, my, my dad wanted me to be an engineer. My form of rebellion was to get a physics degree. <laughs> okay. Um, but now, essentially, what I do is engineering. But I don't have an engineering degree, OK? <laughs> um, but my dad goes, yeah, it only took you 20 years to become an engineer. <laughs> so you can, you can be an engineer at any age. Other questions? Oh, well, uh, hey, I'd like to thank you for coming. Thanks. And uh, we have cookies yeah. out in the back yeah. if you're interested. Thank yeah. you. And I, have, I still have stickers if you want stickers. Thanks. <laughs> Judah, and I'm giving you a, a green laser pointer. Oh, thank you. It's a lot of fun. It's... Uh huh. <laughs> the second thing is that, with respect to your first question, the way it's dealt with with a deep tumor is that you have, there are two ways. The first one is you have a rotating source that's focused on the tumor, but it, ro but it rotates around. And the second one is you have many beams so that the density is yeah, everywhere except at the tumor where it's focused. Okay. And that's not, that, that idea is not limited to, to lasers. That's used with, with microwave signals as well, the same idea. There's a thing called the gamma knife, which works the same way. You have many beams that are focused on the bad place, and the intensity everywhere else is much less. Or are you talking about the radiation? The radiation. Yeah, yeah. You come at it like a jack was what it was. You know, like jacks, the game, where it's like... Uh, yeah, with many different yeah. beams. So the healthy right. tissue only gets pierced once. The, the stuff that's at the center yeah. of all of those but, axes but, but gets it many times. The other answer to the question is that when you have that problem, you are in big trouble. And and, and and a certain amount of collateral damage is yeah, worth it because you are in big trouble. Yeah. Okay. And, and if you don't do that, you're on the final approach. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. very often you do these things because the alternative is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. But the multiple bean system is kind of a standard method. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. Have a great afternoon. Oh, so with John Martinez and those guys? Have a cookie. Yeah. John was a good friend of mine. Yeah. We, did a, we did at least a half a dozen dishes together. Oh, that's great. That's great. And uh, I worked a lot with Clark Hamilton. Yeah, was, yeah. Uh, uh, and Clark, Clark and I were uh, kind of the ones behind the... Um, the Joseph and Paul Yeah, 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 yeah. Large yeah, arrays yeah. of Joseph Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and I got interested in chaos theory in that. Uh-huh. Uh, I wrote a book uh -huh. about chaos. Uh -huh.